Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this webinar, uh, which is organized by the Department of Education of the University of Nicosia in Cyprus. Uh, it is a part of a webinar series that uh, have been offered by our department so far. Um, and it is the first one, I should say, that uh, will be held in English language. Uh, let me introduce myself uh, first. Uh, I am Kyriakos Dimitriou. I'm a lecturer in Special and Inclusive Education. Uh, I would like to thank you for uh, tuning in uh, to this webinar. Um, the topic um, is about the rights of children with disabilities uh, in educational practice. Uh, I think um, that this topic remains contemporary uh, since children with disabilities uh, do not seem to enjoy to avail themselves of the rights uh, that they have. Most, uh, many children with disabilities do not enjoy the rights um, that are in place according uh, to a number of, uh, of uh, conventions, uh, international conventions. Um, and, uh, of course, the philosophy of contemporary inclusive education. Um, so this is what uh, we are going to discuss in the next uh, 50, 60 minutes or so. Um, I should say that our department uh, offers a taught master degree in the area of special and inclusive education, uh, currently in Greek language. Uh, and this topic um, is amongst the topics uh, that uh, we cover in, in our program. Uh, briefly, um, in this webinar, um, we are going to talk a little bit about uh, children's rights, as I said, uh, especially the rights uh, of children with disability. Uh, I will talk a little bit about particular international conventions uh, about uh, human rights and children's rights. Uh, we will try to understand inclusion um, as uh, the ultimate goal of contemporary education uh, in relation to uh, the fundamental right, if I can say, to education for everyone. Um, we will also explore the importance of uh, the freedom of expression for all children, which is one of the rights that I will elaborate on. Um, I will focus especially on children with uh, severe communication impairment, uh, and I will discuss how these children, or nonverbal children as we call them, uh, enjoy these rights, or if they enjoy, if they avail themselves of these rights. Um, we will consider also some simple strategies um, that uh, promote spontaneous communication uh, and self-determination for children uh, with uh, special educational needs. Uh, and finally, we will elaborate on the design of enabling environments that promote actually this, um, and, uh, this initial, uh, uh, spontaneous communication uh, and, of course, meaningful uh, choices within uh, their children's daily uh, lives. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the rights that children have are recognized uh, by all states uh, through particular relevant conventions. Um, these particular conventions were signed by state governments uh, and agreed, um, and governments ratified um, and uh, put them into practice. Um, uh, historically now, uh, if you remember from history, during and after World War uh, II, uh, the Allies adopted uh, four freedoms. Um, one, the first one was freedom of speech, we have freedom of religion, freedom from fear, and uh, freedom from want. Uh, these uh, four freedoms are known as the basic war aims, and they are known as the precursor uh, of the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights uh, that followed uh, in 1948 after uh, uh, the, the World War II. Uh, ended. Um, if you remember uh, from history, um, the whole world, especially uh, the, the continent of Europe, uh, were in ruins um, after uh, the war. So um, uh, this document um, is a milestone, if I can say, document in the history of human rights. Um, 
and uh, made um, made sure that the nations recognize that all humans are born free, uh, all all humans are born equal in dignity and uh, rights, uh, regardless of their origins. I mean, nationality, the place of residence, their gender, uh, national or ethnic origin, their color, religion, language, or any other status. Um, However, at that stage, um, when that declaration was agreed and signed, uh, there was no any particular reference uh, to a very peculiar population, group of people. I'm talking about children. Uh, there was no any reference to children's rights in that declaration. Uh, and by speaking uh, by legal terms, when we are saying children, uh, we mean human uh, people's, uh, people sorry, aged under 17 or 18. Um, and this happened uh, four decades later, 41 years later, um, when the, the, the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child was adopted uh, by the United Nations. Um, and uh, this happened uh, in particular in 1989. Uh, it consists of uh, 54 articles. Um, and. Um, they uh, they actually describe um, they contain if you want rights um, a set of rights about economic uh, political social cultural and civil rights um, and they uh, they apply to every child without any exception uh, in simpler words uh, the articles detail uh, what the child needs uh, to survive uh, what the child needs to grow to participate and uh, fulfill their potential. These uh, 54 articles uh, of the Convention of the Rights of the Child uh, apply to every child, as I said. Uh, and this is described by these four features that I have in this slide. Uh, the rights uh, in the UNCRC, the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, uh, are universal, indivisible, inalienable, and unconditional. What do we mean with universal? Um, we mean that these rights are the same for every child, uh, regardless of race, regardless of sex, religion, uh, politics, gender, etc. Uh, they apply to everyone uh, with no any particular, uh, any particular status or condition. They are indivisible, uh, which means that they are equally important. All the, all the, the, the rights that are described in, in the convention are equally important and they are interdependent, um, which means that they depend on each other. If we have one right that is not satisfied, it is not met, uh, this will affect uh, other rights in turn, uh, something like a domino effect. For example, uh, we have the right to education. If children actually don't avail themselves of this very fundamental basic right, this in turn will affect many other rights that children have, uh, like the, the rights to express uh, their uh, opinion freely. Um, they are inalienable. Uh, which means that all human beings have rights uh, that they cannot be taken away. Uh, no one can deny uh, those rights to children. Uh, and also they are unconditional. We don't have conditions to get those rights. You get them, children get them simply because they are alive, simply because they are human beings. We will revisit uh, this uh, convention um, uh, very soon, uh, the United Nations Convention on the Child and particular articles. Uh, before that, uh, let's, let's touch a little bit the philosophy of inclusion in education um, and some other relevant terms that I have in this slide. Uh, most probably uh, most of the people who are watching this uh, either live or later have different backgrounds 
Um, so before we talk about inclusion in education and the rights of children uh, with uh, special educational needs, I would like to make sure that we, we all interpret the terms inclusion, exclusion, integration and separation in the same way. Uh, I think these terms will facilitate the discussion that will follow. That's why I want to make sure that we all uh, interpret them in the same way. Um, and just to make it more interactive, uh, I would call you, I, I would give you a few seconds if we have people with us uh, to think how these four terms uh, match uh, with the figures in, in this uh, slide. Um, and then we can go through them together. Uh, I will give you some tips before um, just to help. Uh, imagine that the green dots in these figures represent uh, children without special educational needs. Um, the red dots represent children who have special educational needs, uh, including disabilities. And um, the, the circles, the black circles, represent uh, the school uh, settings. Okay, so hopefully this helps a bit. Um, a few seconds, if only if you want to type uh, your answers, you can uh, you can use the chat uh, um, if you have any ideas. So let's uh, let's start with Figure A. Um, here, what do we have here? We have exclusion. Uh, in the past, children with severe disabilities uh, were excluded uh, from education in general. Uh, and there are examples from past centuries uh, about the negative stance uh, towards children uh, with disabilities by the society, including uh, educators, including teachers as well. Um, so the figure A is, uh, depicts uh, exclusion. Um, what about uh, figure B now? Uh, what do we have here? We have separation um, or segregation, as it is known. Uh, the right to education that children with disabilities uh, have uh, was recognized then. Uh, and this happened in 18th, 19th century, uh, at least in Europe. Uh, um, so the right that they had to education was recognized and we had the uh, formation, uh, the opening, if you want, of a number of special schools or found foundations at this stage. Um, thus, children with special educational needs were educated, but separately from children without special educational needs in different settings. That's why we call it segregation or separation. In figure C now, uh, we have uh, what we call integration. And this happened in 70s. Uh, we have a very important report in, in the UK, the Warnock Report, uh, that called actually to integrate children uh, um, in the mainstream school, in, in regular schools. Um, so there was this trend in 70s supporting the idea uh, to have this physical integration of children with special needs in um, regular mainstream settings, uh, but not necessarily the same settings with uh, the other children, not the same classroom in the school. Um, at that stage, we had uh, uh, mainly the formation of special units or classrooms within the mainstream schools. Uh, if you want, uh, we can say that we had the transfer of special schools into regular schools. Uh, and of course, that wasn't enough uh, because many barriers continued uh, to maintain their exclusion uh, and unequal learning opportunities for children with disabilities. Last figure uh, represents inclusion uh, that uh, we will define soon. Uh, from the figure, we understand that uh, it is about including everyone because we remove that extra uh, black circle from this figure. So we remove somehow the, some barriers, if you want, or walls of se segregation that we had with integration. Uh, so we have this deletion, if I can say, of this. Uh, of this black circle, so the deletion of, uh, of uh, barriers uh, that created uh, this separation or segregation. 
Um, I should say that these very simple, um, fi these very simple figures um, summarize um, the historical development uh, from exclusion to inclusion, how we started and how we ended up uh, to nowadays. And of course, it's impossible to uh, speak about, to talk about inclusion uh, without any reference to a very important uh, statement, Salamanca statement. Uh, it's probably the most important agreement that called state governments to adopt inclusive practices in their educational settings. Um, it is known as Salamanca statement. Uh, Salamanca is a small town in uh, Spain close to the, the border with Portugal. Um, so what happened there in 1994, in June 1994, uh, we had a conference, a web conference uh, that uh, was organized by 92 governments and 25 international organizations. Uh, the topic was special, uh, special needs education, of course. Uh, and uh, this uh, conference concluded to this statement and framework for action on the education of children with disabilities. This statement called for the very first time for inclusion to be the norm. Uh, and I should say here that all European countries uh, ratified this statement. Um, uh, European countries agreed to make all necessary changes uh, in, order, in order to promote inclusion in their educational settings. Um, and as I said earlier, this agreement in Salamanca was probably the cornerstone, without any exaggeration, the cornerstone of, of inclusive education. Another important convention now uh, that came a bit later in 2006, uh, it, um, it was the United Nations Convention on Rights of People with Disabilities. Uh, it is probably the most important and recent policy document of the United Nations uh, concerning the rights uh, that people with disabilities have as equal human beings. Um, and uh, this convention uh, consists of 50, 50 articles. Um, and I have here uh, in this slide one of these articles, article number 24. Uh, which refers to educational policy practice uh, and calls state parties to ensure uh, an inclusive education system at all levels, uh, from um, the, the nursery, from the kindergarten, uh, to higher education, to the university. Uh, this uh, convention was uh, signed by 181 countries uh, and ratified, uh, including, of course, uh, all European countries. Now, we refer to inclusion, uh, but what is inclusion? How can we define it? Uh, I should say that this term can be defined in many different ways. Uh, and of course, it can be interpreted by several countries in different ways. Uh, but in general, uh, inclusion should not be seen as a, a simple placement. In, in the regular school, uh, within educational settings. Uh, so it is not about physical access of children with disability in the, in the regular school, in a regular school. Uh, it must be rather something bigger than this. It is about adapting curri the curriculum, the our assessment practices, uh, teaching and learning uh, in order to include people with uh, special educational needs within a classroom. Uh, and the school at micro level. But at the macro level is even some, something much bigger. At macro level, inclusion uh, asks for the, the whole transformation of the education system. Uh, and that's not just adjusting as teachers, as educators, and compensating individual needs, something which is challenging. Um, it is about changing uh, the curriculum in order to allow everyone, the children with or children without special educational needs, uh, to take part in the process of learning in a, a regular classroom. 
Uh, and of course, inclusion, as you can understand, and from your experiences, um, is a great challenge for educators. Um, as we are called, teachers are called to make all necessary adjust adjustments uh, in order to meet uh, the learning needs of the learners, uh, rather than expecting our learners to meet our demands uh, and uh, requirements. Uh, let's revisit now uh, the United Nations Convention on the Right of the Child. As I said, I will focus on two particular articles of this convention. Uh, I should say briefly that this convention has many, describes uh, many other rights, um, uh, basic fundamental rights that children have. It recognizes the, the very important right to education, the, the right to access health services, uh, the right, uh, even the right that children have to play, the, the, the right to leisure. All children have this right to play. Um, but I chose to focus on two particular articles, or two particular rights that are very similar and connected um, for a particular reason that I will explain uh, very soon. Uh, so in this slide, we have uh, article number 12, uh, which actually is the right, uh, describes the right that children have to express their views freely. So state parties, according to this article, shall ensure that the child who is capable of forming his or her own views, uh, the right to express those views freely in all matters affecting the child. Um, so we have the right, it recognizes the right that children have to express their views freely. And it says, interestingly, children who are capable what do they mean that if they are not capable, if for a particular reason they don't speak, for instance, uh, they haven't acquired the language because of a particular impairment, doesn't speak that this, does it mean that these children, uh, they shouldn't enjoy the right that they have actually to, uh, to express their views freely? We keep this because I will revisit it. Let's see what our article uh, number 13 says. Uh, according to this article, the child should have the right to freedom of expression, which is similar to article 12, as I said. This right shall include free freedom to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas of all kinds, regardless of frontiers, either orally, in writing or in print, et cetera, et cetera. So we have two interesting, important, I would say, right? Freedom to expression and the freedom to express our views freely. But what happens when we have to work with children with special educational needs, especially children with severe learning difficulties, children Nonverbal children, children who, for, for a particular reason, uh, di did not acquire the language. Uh, what about cases of children um, with autism, uh, with severe autism, for instance, uh, who many times actually are nonverbal children? And the question that arises here uh, that I took from um, the authors that I have in this slide, Potter and Whitaker, um, who explored the area. Um, to what extent can children who experience severe impairments in the area of communication, uh, such as those with severe or profound learning impairment, or children with severe autism, regularly avail themselves, they enjoy, if you want, the rights that um, we, um, uh, uh, I mentioned a few minutes earlier? Um, and uh, the, the, the answer to, to this question unfortunately, is not as often as uh, they should do. And what's the reason? Um, the reason, according to the same uh, authors, is the quality, has to do with the quality of the environment, has to do with uh, the quality of the communication environments that we uh, adults create around children, around them. Um, this is the main problem rather than uh, children themselves and the impairment they have. So we may have a problem uh, 
uh, here uh, with uh, the practical implication of inclusion itself and the conventions that I mentioned earlier that we agreed and ratified uh, and uh, assigned, agreed to put them into practice. Uh, it seems that we have a practical problem of the implication of inclusion and the convention in the cases of children with severe learning difficulties. Uh, and the problem lays around uh, the environment, as I said, uh, because the environment is not always enabling enough uh, or supporting enough uh, for such uh, populations. Now, uh, the United Nations uh, Convention on the Rights of the Child uh, clearly states that all rights apply to everyone, to every child, uh, with no exceptions. I remind you what I said earlier in, uh, in another slide, uh, that the four futures of children's rights, uh, that they are universal, uh, rights are indivisible, inalienable, and unconditional. They apply to everyone with, uh, without condition. They are all important, and we cannot take them away from everyone, from anyone. As can be easily understood, uh, adults who deal with non verbal children in inclusive settings uh, are not aware most of the times or are not trained well in how um, uh, we can enable, they can enable children's communication uh, or they can how they can enable them to express their views freely, even if they cannot speak. Um, because this means that uh, what we call self-advocacy, uh, our ability to defend ourselves, uh, is problematic uh, for non-verbal children. The way that adults uh, working with such children in inclusive settings uh, does not uh, promote uh, what we call spontaneous communication. And I will explain what I mean with spontaneous. Um, we, we only expect children to respond to our prompts passively, to adult prompts, uh, and they have uh, very limited um, opportunities to communicate uh, spontaneously or to initiate communication. Uh, what we usually do is to stand in front of them uh, because we tend to underestimate their abilities. We say they don't speak. Uh, so they cannot communicate, but we know very well that we can communicate even without speaking any language. We can use spot language. Even infants who don't speak at the very early stage of their life are able to communicate with their mom, uh, even from day one. So even if they don't speak, even if we have nonverbal children in our settings, my point here is that, of course, they can communicate. And uh, the way they communicate it has to do with the enabling environment. If the environment is enabling enough, then children, of course, will initiate communication. And we will see some strategies how we can support this. What we usually do is to stand in front of them and pose questions. We ask them questions according to our wants, our agendas. Um, and uh, this way of communication is known as prompt communication. Therefore, communication, as uh, you can see in this slide, uh, can, be, can be split into two forms. Uh, we have prompt communication uh, when children respond uh, respond to, to adults' agendas and concerns. Uh, but it is obvious that in, in the case of prompt communication, uh, children are passive responders as uh, others decide on their behalf. Uh, and on the other hand, we have spontaneous communication. Uh, it is when children communicate spontaneously, they take the initiative to, sponta to, to, to communicate spontaneously. Uh, and in this case, of course, we have freedom of expression because they are free to express their needs. Uh, they are free uh, to express their wants. Uh, so in the second uh, um, form of communication, children uh, become active or agents or even proactive agents, uh, proactive because they initiate, they take the initiative to communicate that rather than uh, prompting them 
to, to initiate any communication. As you can understand, uh, spontaneous communication is crucial and vital for everyone. But in the case of children with uh, special educational needs, either verbal or nonverbal, but in particular nonverbal, it's even more crucial and vital because if they don't learn how to initiate communication or if they don't know, if they don't acquire the skills how to uh, communicate their wants and needs, then we will have some detrimental consequences. We have some benefits when children uh, learn uh, how to initiate uh, communication spontaneously. It is important because it is a human right if we uh, make connections with the, the rights that I described earlier. It is the main means uh, that children uh, will use to express themselves. Um, however, as uh, you can guess, children with severe impairments, as I said, um, including nonverbal children, don't, they, they are not given opportunities uh, to express. They are not given many opportunities because some, some teachers, of course, give them opportunities. Um, but most of them are not given opportunities to express their views. They are not given opportunities to make choices freely and independently. Uh, and the main reason is because of our stance, our erroneous um, beliefs. Um, uh, and our tendency to underestimate their capacities. Uh, we think that we waste our time if we let them uh, free to make choices because we think that they cannot make any choice. Uh, so we decide on, on their behalf. Um, so as we can see, some, we somehow violate the Convention on the Rights, especially the Articles 12 and 13 that I, refer, I referred to earlier. Um, so in other words, prompt communication does not go hand in hand um, with the convention. Um, and uh, therefore, children's needs are not always met uh, and their rights, rights uh, sorry, are not uh, protected. Uh, something that doesn't go hand in hand uh, with the philosophy uh, of inclusion. And it puts actually the philosophy of inclusion at a high risk. Now, what uh, research shows about nonverbal children? Um, first, we should uh, confess that uh, we do not have much research done uh, regarding um, nonverbal children. Um, let's take the example of autism, of low functioning autism, uh, where we have many no nonverbal children. Uh, and uh, so we don't have much research done. Uh, exploring um, how much uh, children with uh, low functioning autism uh, initiate communication. Um, the little research that we have that uh, compares mainly uh, severe autism, uh, nonverbal children, uh, with typically developing children. They make these comparisons. Uh, and it, it shows that the rates of communication initiation, um, how often, I mean, uh, nonverbal children initiate communication is very low. Uh, for instance, I have uh, the two studies here, uh, Pasco and uh, colleagues 2008 and Stone and Carol Martinez 1990, uh, who found uh, that ch nonverbal children, two year old with autism, uh, the, he initiated uh, communication only three times in an hour. And when we compare this ratio with children without any special educational needs, uh, they found that the same age children, uh, two year old, uh, initiate communication 200 times. So imagine it is uh, almost 70 times more. Um, but I should say that uh, these research those research examples uh, did not focus on the role of the environment. Uh, they just compared, uh, they counted uh, the, the times um, of uh, 
communication initiation, but they didn't focus on uh, uh, factors uh, or the role, if you want, of the of the communication environment. Uh, but according to Potter and Whitaker, um, who carried out a research that uh, took into consideration the role of communication environment, um, they found actually uh, that different aspects uh, in the environment uh, may disable self-initiation, um, self-initiate communication. Um, they found that children uh, with autism uh, do communicate spontaneously. Uh, and what we believe and this uh, um, erroneous conception that we have um, is not valid, that children actually who don't speak cannot communicate. Uh, they found, interestingly, that children with autism, even if they don't speak, they do communicate spontaneously. And of course, this finding opposes uh, what older uh, literature supported. So what uh, or how if you want, can we approach children uh, with severe communication issues in our settings, which is a great challenge. Uh, what we usually do from my experience working with children and with colleagues, uh, we tend to stand in front of them and we prompt them to communicate through questions. We ask questions and these questions are according to our agendas. Uh, for example, uh, when we have a uh, snack or fruit time in, in the nursery, in the kindergarten, uh, and we decide that it is, um, they, they, they will need apples, let's say, um, we, we just stand in front of them and we ask them, uh, for example, time to eat your apple. Uh, so we don't give them any choice. Uh, in this example, children are passive agents of communication with prompt, our prompt, adult prompt. Uh, they don't have any other choice. Uh, they will eat the apple that we hold in front of them because we decided, uh, because we chose the fruit, we didn't give them even uh, the, the option to choose. Uh, and of course, uh, we decided what time they are going to eat it. We don't know if they are hungry or not. We didn't even ask them. We didn't give them the opportunity to express uh, if, they're, if they're hungry or not. Um, so how can we promote what I described earlier as spontaneous communication? Uh, the best way to communicate this is by pausing, so by avoiding this questioning and prompting children through questions. Uh, and this happens when children respond uh, to naturally occurring cues in the environment. Uh, so let's say we have particular stimulus in the environment within their view, uh, even if they are out of reach, uh, but children can see those stimulus, let's say different fruits or different toys. And of course, uh, we teach them in advance how to express uh, their, uh, their wants and needs uh, for example, if they want to play with a particular toy by pointing, multi-pointing, or with other systems of, uh, of communication that I will, um, I will describe. Um, so an example of spontaneous communication could be that we have particular toys, objects uh, that, partic that operate as stimulus uh, within children's view. Um, and uh, children are given these, uh, the freedom uh, to initiate communication, provided that we taught them, of course, that they have this option to choose. And uh, we taught them how to, uh, to communicate that need and want. Um, so, for, for, for instance, a child would see a toy which is out of reach. And uh, she or he realizes that he, uh, he wants to play with that toy. Uh, and uh, we teach the, him in advance, of course, how to communicate this, uh, rather than asking him uh, in front of, of him, holding the toy in front of him and prompting him uh, to play with that toy because we want, uh, we decided, and we chose it on their behalf. So children can be trained to initiate communication and they can 
be trained to become active and pr even proactive to initiate to take this initiative uh, are agents uh, of spontaneous communication and one system that is well known in this area is Makaton uh, probably uh, many of you heard about Makaton uh, which is a program that consists of uh, graphic symbols uh, some manual signs um, based on body language, some signs that we do with hands uh, mainly. Um, it is designed uh, for people with problems with verbal communication. Um, it is not a complete language system because there are similarities with sign language, but it, it, sign language is a perfect language system. Makaton is not a perfect language system, is uh, is a... Um, a, a, gra a program, let's say language program with si some graphic symbols, um, uh, basic symbols, how uh, they can communicate uh, for people, as I said, uh, with um, limited verbal communication skills. Uh, so uh, in, in this uh, slide, for example, I have um, the uh, how children are the sign uh, that uh, represents Apple which is this, and you can find, I should say, on the internet, many other, uh, there are videos even on YouTube about Makaton, and you can learn even more si signs. Uh, so if we teach them these very uh, simple signs, uh, children will learn uh, first that uh, they, they know how uh, to symbolize Apple in this case, or a, a toys and stuff. And then they know that they have actually the option and choice to make their needs and wants uh, known uh, and initiate communication freely uh, rather than uh, uh, reacting um, to, to our prompt uh, passively. Um, Hale 1987, um, and I'm talking about the last point of this uh, slide, um, suggested uh, that we should move away uh, from prompt uh, communication uh, if we want to promote uh, spontaneous communication. Uh, this means that it is preferable, according to this uh, researcher, uh, to avoid any uh, kind of questioning. Uh, so we should avoid any kind of concrete type of prompts because questioning uh, is a concrete type of prompt. Uh, so instead of standing in front of them and asking these concrete prompts, time to eat apple, uh, which is according to our decisions and agendas, it is preferable to move away from this concrete and um, and uh, wait for them or actually use the sign uh, from Marketon uh, as a prompt. Uh, and uh, steadily, actually, we move to the other edge of this continuum that Hill uh, describes uh, uh, to spontaneous, fully spontaneous communication. When we pause, we don't speak, we don't even use any sign, uh, and we wait for children to initiate communication, provided, of course, that we taught them in advance before how to sign uh, using Makaton or um, how to point or multi-point um, uh, if we have the cues uh, in the environment within uh, their view. So the continuum of prompts is to move away from the one edged edge of this uh, continuum, of this line, uh, to avoid prompt communication and to move towards fully spontaneous communication. This is the idea. So in the case of Apple, that uh, the Apple that I, I referred earlier is to just pause and wait for the child to sign Apple in response to seeing a bowl uh, of apples on a shelf. Or if we have a bowl of different fruits, we even give them also the, the option to choose. Uh, so they, they can use other uh, different signs from Marketon again, uh, or uh, if we put them in different bowls so uh, children can point uh, what fruit they prefer uh, to eat and when they want, because they, they will choose when they will initiate communication. It is apparent that uh, when uh, we, 
um, adults move away from concrete prompts, uh, we enable children uh, to express their views um, according to the rights that I referred to earlier. Uh, children gain uh, direct control over their everyday environment um, and their needs and wants uh, become uh, known. Uh, so the idea here is to avoid standing in front of them and prompting by asking questions. Of course, some may think now, what are you saying? Should We shouldn't speak to them. Of course, we speak to them. I'm talking about some strategies, how to promote uh, spontaneous communication. So the, in, in, a, in the framework of particular activities, uh, we can implement this idea. We can just pause for a while. Uh, we can just set the environment with the cues, the stimulus within their uh, view, and uh, just uh, wait for them to initiate and uh, provide it, as I said um, earlier, that we taught them uh, that they are free to choose, uh, they are free to decide, uh, we are here to listen to them, okay? Um, and uh, our priority uh, should be uh, to change this environment, to set the enabling environment that promotes uh, spontaneous communication. Well, now let's uh, try to put this into practice uh, with the help of two hypothetical scenarios. Uh, for both uh, scenarios, um, try to think uh, what kind of communication we have uh, and uh, which approach is more beneficial for children and why. Okay, so let's start with scenario one. We have five children uh, with uh, severe autism in little or no speech who are sitting around the table at snack time. Uh, we have an adult in uh, standing uh, um, who is standing in the room and offers children a drink by going round the table and asking each child in turn, uh, do you want orange or do you want lemon to drink? Orange juice or a lemonade. And the adult is holding each bottle in front of each uh, child. So imagine the adult with two bottles in hand uh, in front of the child, asking the child, do you want this or this? Each child uh, uh, waits his or his, her, her turn, having been previously taught to do so. So this is the first scenario. Let's uh, look at the second scenario, which is slightly different. Here, we have again five children with severe autism in little or no speech. Again, these children are sitting around the table at snack time. But in this case, the bottles of drink are behind the adult, on different table, out of reach, but within the children's view. Children cannot reach them, but children can see them. Uh, the adult waits without speaking for children uh, to indicate their wants. Once child points to the orange bottle, he is immediately given the drink. Uh, the adult says orange as the child takes it. So, uh, what kind of communication we have in each scenario? Um, and which approach is more beneficial, uh, everything, and why? Um, I think it's easy to guess if you understand, uh, if you have in mind the two forms of communication that I described earlier, prompt and spontaneous communication. So in the first scenario, we have an example of prompt communication uh, where the adult is standing in front of them and uh, actually prompts them to, to choose either oranges or lemon juice. Uh, so children respond passively to our agendas. In the second scenario, uh, the one that uh, we have now in, in this slide, um, we have, of course, we are trying to promote what I described as for spontaneous communication. So there is a number of things that children are taught in the first scenario. We revisit the first scenario. Children are being taught to respond uh, to the communication of the adult. Uh, 
and um, they are taught to wait their turn, which is not bad. It is not bad to learn how to wait our turn, but maybe it's not the best idea to teach it uh, when we want to promote spontaneous communication. Uh, we can teach it in the framework of different activities. Um, in this case, in scenario one, adult is using uh, concrete strategies, prompt questions, okay, direct verbal questioning. Uh, and we have this immediate visual cue in front of them. Um, so we don't give them the choice actually to look at, at anything else, either this or this. So we have an example of prompt communication. And the access, uh, the drink access here depends on children's passive agreement, um, which is rewarded actually with a drink. So we reinforce this behavior by giving them this drink. They, they win the drink by obeying, if I can say. And this reminds us more or less uh, what behaviorism uh, suggests. So let's, uh, see, uh, let's visit uh, the second scenario. Again, we have a number of things that children are taught in this scenario. Uh, the scenario where we have uh, spontaneous communication. Uh, where children have the bottles within their view, but out of reach, behind the adult. Uh, and th they, they know in advance that they are free to choose, and they know in advance how to point or even sign using Marketon signs. Um, so children in this scenario are taught to initiate communication spontaneously. Uh, we set uh, the suitable enabling environment to promote this. Uh, and we don't have direct concrete prompts in this case. Uh, children do not need to wait for their turn. And this is the point. Uh, that's why we call it um, spontaneous initiation or spontaneous communication. They, they are proactive agents. They don't wait their turns. They take the initiative to communicate their wants and needs. Uh, they are autonomous, independent agents, and they gain somehow the control. Um, and the access to a drink in this case is uh, de dependent on proactive rather than passive behavior that we had in, in scenario one. Uh, moving from uh, the, the first to the second scenario uh, needs, of course, a number of uh, teaching steps. Uh, children should be trained uh, and experienced in observing uh, the stimulus. Uh, the cues uh, within their view, and of course, pointing or multi-pointing. Um, Porter and Whitaker, I should say, suggest uh, something that they described as minimal speech uh, approach. Uh, so they suggested that it is preferable to withdraw steadily, withdraw speech and verbal prompts uh, when it comes to decision making and choosing. Um, and we should promote pointing and multi-pointing. Uh, so children should learn uh, to communicate their needs and wants uh, spontaneously uh, because lack uh, of such skills uh, might be detrimental for later uh, life, in later life, in adulthood. Um, it, might, it may lead to frustration when they don't acquire the skill to express their wants and needs. Uh, and this will affect the, 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 the lifestyle, which might be restricted. Um, they may develop um, challenging behavior, less appropriate behaviors, uh, or they may even have restricted opportunities for self-fulfillment and enjoyment of life itself, um, which means that these puts their human rights at risk, some of the rights that uh, we described earlier. Okay, beyond... Uh, let me check the time. Okay, we're about to finish in a few minutes. Uh, beyond the freedom of expression uh, that is supported by the promotion of spontaneous communication, briefly, I should say that uh, we have another basic, very important um, right, which is uh, uh, called uh, self-determination. Uh, Self-determination is a developmental process, developmental with the sense that it develops uh, during life from birth to uh, uh, to adulthood um, and refers to the right, the very important right that we have to act as primary causal agents. Uh, in simpler words, 
Um, it has to do with our ability, which is a right, okay, a basic human right, which is described in the Convention on the Rights of the Child, uh, that uh, they should be enabled to make choices and decisions. They should be uh, enabled to solve problems, to be capable enough to solve problems, to set goals. And of course, uh, for uh, it, 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 the Convention uh, asks, calls adults to involve children uh, when it comes to make decisions, to make choices on their behalf, uh, to set goals, uh, etc. It is a fundamental human right, although it is uh, it's important many times is overlooked by us, uh, simply because we tend to underestimate uh, their ability to set goals, or we don't involve them in, um, in any decision-making process. We should teach, I should say, self-determination to something that it can be acquired, it can be taught from early years, from early childhood. Um, when children are, are taught, for example, to make choices independently, uh, they gain the control uh, of their everyday uh, environment. Uh, for example, they become aware of how to ask for specific help uh, and make preferences known. Uh, they know uh, where to sit. Um, they choose. Uh, they, they, they choose where to sit. Sorry, or they they uh, they choose the order of tasks. Uh, how we start. Uh, what's uh, next? Uh, they choose which computer program to use. Um, what game to choose? Uh, with whom to play with? With whom to sit? Um, when to stop an activity, etc. Um, another important skill related to self-determination is self uh, is uh, problem solving, um, and an effective way to teach these kind of skills uh, is to choose to pick a, an activity that children are familiar with, something that they know well, they experienced in in, in the past, and we choose some small parts of from that activity. Uh, to create small problems, to problematize if you want familiar activities or events. Uh, and then children are um, given the opportunity to reflect on those activities more deeply and take active part uh, in the process. In the next slide, uh, there is a problem solving scenario about making mousse chocolate. Uh, I will read the scenario and uh, I would invite you to think uh, the, the purposes of this, uh, uh, this activity, um, the, the, the main purpose, the primary and uh, the secondary purpose. During a simple cookery session, once children are familiar with uh, the routine of making a packet mousse, Adults could gradually withdraw help so that by degrees, children are making more of the decisions themselves. For example, instead of adults opening a packet and pouring its contents into a bowl, children could be offered an unopened packet. And this is the small problem that I described earlier that we create in this familiar for children activity. Uh, the setting up a problem which the children need to solve. If children are unable to open it with their hands, they could be offered a ruler or a pair of scissors, again requiring them to think more deeply about the nature of the task. Adults should then continue to offer nonverbal opportunities for children to reflect and make decisions. What should happen after the packet is open? What utensils will be needed? Where are they? What is the order in which ingredients are put in the bowl? Adults can scaffold these problem-solving activities in a graduated way. For example, initially, they could offer either scissors or a ruler with which to open the packet. Later, they could ex expect children to remember that they need scissors and, go and to go and find them. For those children who have significant problems with understanding spoken language, it is important to use a minimal speech approach. 
where no more, I, I mentioned this earlier, if you remember, where no more than two or three keywords are mapped directly to the children's actions. This requires the adults to think through the activity and plan how decision-making can be presented non-verbally uh, with appropriate pauses to give the children an opportunity to, for thinking and spontaneous communication. So in this scenario, we problematize something familiar, provided that children experience that in the past with the help of adults or other children. Uh, and of course, we chose an activity that motivates children. Uh, children are given the opportunity to make active part, uh, to take active part. Uh, they become active agents uh, in, a, in a safe environment. We are present anyway. Um, and it is an environment where they can act as independent agents. Uh, and this enables them to reflect on those activities more deeply and take up active part uh, in the process, of course. Um, so the primary aim was, of course, to promote uh, problem solving skills, uh, the, the, these basic rights that I described earlier, self-determination, how to determine themselves. And the secondary aim was something that motivates children to produce to, uh, chocolate mousse. Summing up now, we're finishing. Uh, we can see that uh, children's rights uh, are protected uh, by conven the conventions that I described earlier and inclusive education uh, itself. Uh, but I would say that they are protected in theory uh, most of the times um, because we cannot claim that all children avail themselves of the rights uh, that are described in these conventions. Uh, nor we can claim that all inclusive settings are always um, always protect uh, children's rights and uh, promote self-determination uh, through spontaneous communication. Because as we can see, uh, children with severe um, uh, children with um, severe impairment, um, especially nonverbal children, are uh, usually passive agents uh, of adults' prompts, uh, of adults' choices, of adults' decisions, uh, and so on. Um, especially now with COVID-19 pandemic, adults made decisions to close schools, uh, to switch to online education without even taking into consideration children with uh, special educational needs. Uh, some of those children saw themselves excluded from online education. Um, so uh, the, the, some of their rights were violated. Uh, it wouldn't be an exaggeration to claim here that uh, we are good in theory, as I said, but not very good in practice all the times. Uh, we make several excuses, such as children's inability to make decisions, uh, choices, or even to express themselves. Uh, but uh, we can see that the ideas uh, that I discussed earlier, uh, especially for children with severe uh, impairments, if, can communicate their needs. Uh, they can communicate their views, uh, but we should teach them how to do so. And of course, we should set the enabling and supporting environment. Uh, therefore, uh, we can claim here that the success and failure of the venture that we call inclusion depends on us, on educators, the strategies and practices uh, that we implement in our direct classrooms in order to deal with a variety of uh, heterogeneous learners that we have in our settings. Now, uh, I don't know if we have any comments. Uh, I can't see any comments uh, on the chat. If we don't have any comments or questions, I would like to thank you very much for watching this webinar um, and for your active participation. Uh, I hope that you found it, um, you found these ideas, the discussed ideas helpful and uh, that will inspire and inform your practices. Uh, my email address appears here in this slide, so feel free to drop me a line to contact me uh, to discuss anything um, related to this topic. Uh, so thank you very much um, and uh, have a great afternoon. See you.